Welcome to Legendary, a game whose title disproves nominative determinism. It was developed by Spark Unlimited, a studio known for their terminal case of mediocrity. Still, Legendary is one of the better games of their lineup. It's a first person shooter set in the modern day that focuses on shooting mythological creatures, so it's inherently hard to go wrong. This is the game that originally got me interested in obscure, budget, and jank games in the first place, so let's get started. The game starts off with our protagonist named Deckard of all names, uh, unintentionally starting off the apocalypse by quite literally opening Pandora's box. What exactly did he think was gonna happen? Well, for a while, you get to casually stroll around as the apocalypse happens around you. This intro is actually quite well done, though there isn't too much danger to the player in it. That's some pretty good spectacle factor, and I quite like that. It's really highly scripted, more of an interactive cutscene than an actual gameplay segment. You can get bitten by these griffins, but it's not a big deal. It happens every day on your day to work in this world, I guess. A little bit into this intro, you get a fire axe, allowing you to live out your childhood dream of being a firefighter who fights griffins. It's actually a pretty decent melee weapon being viable and useful throughout the whole game. You got some pretty good decapitations too. You then get this pistol shortly after the fire axe. It does equivalent damage to a stationary tuk-tuk. You use it to kill these lava dragon monsters and immediately ditch it when you find something to replace it. These demons have been shooting themselves with smaller bullets in order to build up resistance to larger bullets. But they're not too clever as they didn't shoot themselves with smaller axes just in case humans chose to use large axes instead of bullets. After acquiring some more firepower and battling our way through a subway, we're introduced to the main antagonist. I had to review my footage to remember his name, uh, Lefay, who tricked our protagonist to open the box in the first place. He plans to use the griffins to evade the IRS or something like that. He's very obviously a supervillain, so it adds up. Anyways, after he sends troops after Deckard and his requisite mid-2000s female sidekick, some other troops rescue him, and he joins them in finding Pandora's box. I won't talk much about the story from this point onward, since there's very little to it. There's basically no twists or turns, and a connection between the levels feel a little loose at times. It's one of those cases where the story seems more like a justification for why you go from A to B than anything else. I'll focus on other aspects from now on. Just a quick little aside, but there's a lot of these weird panels that you have to hack. They get less common later on, and they don't really serve any obvious purpose. Sometimes they'll have you face two in a row. My best guess is that they hide a loading trigger. They don't really use these to stall you or anything. Enemies are almost never close to these. You just hold E for 5 seconds and you're done. Pretty riveting challenge if you ask me. As you play, you're slowly introduced to this game's roster of enemies, which in its credit is actually pretty varied. They pace them out pretty well, so new enemies are still popping up later on. You may have guessed it, but they come from a variety of mythologies and not just Greek mythology. Never heard of some of these, so good on them for opting for a handful of more obscure monsters. What makes a roster so good is the fact that a lot of these enemies have little gimmicks to them to make them more interesting to fight. Werewolves need to be decapitated in order to stay dead. These little fairy things called Nari can possess objects and environment to attack you. They're invincible until they possess something, which for some reason makes them vulnerable to bullets. Well, later on you also get Minotaurs, which are exceptionally vulnerable to attacks from behind. Strangely, the game doesn't tell you this until after you've killed your first Minotaur, so... They all have unique introduction cutscenes to hype them up a little, which is a fun touch. Here's something fun, just about all enemy types in this game will fight each other. There's no alliances here, just like the Wild West, or maybe even modern day Texas. The developers have some fun with that in an optional area at one point where you can spawn a lot of standard enemy types and have them duke them out. It's a shame the game doesn't play with this idea more often. The worst part of this game's enemy design is hard to say. A lot of them can take a lot more punishment than Rasputin. The Griffin can take hundreds upon hundreds of LMG rounds to kill, it's just absurd. But then you have the human enemies. Naturally, this game needed hit scanning goons in it since it's a first person shooter made into double O's. They can shred you ridiculously quickly if they want to. There's also something slightly off about combat with them, but it's really hard to put a finger on it. I feel like there's a weird delay between your bullets hitting them and them reacting to it. Like there's some problem with the animation or the hit detection. It's just not really unclear even from playing the game. You can try and judge from my footage, but you probably won't fare much better than I did. So does this game have any gimmicks? Well, your primary power is absorption in what is called Animus Energy, which requires you to stop and hold down the Absorb button for a long time on these pretty orbs. Mythological creatures drop this energy on death, but humans don't. Is it an implication that humans don't have souls? Regardless, it's your primary source of healing. You can store enough Animus Energy to fully heal yourself, but it does take a while. 
The nice convenience is that it automatically heals you when you collect energy while the bar is full. You can also use energy to unleash a blast of energy, which can sometimes be useful since healing is slow. It usually consumes too much energy that's better used for healing, but it does have some nice uses here and there. You also have one extra ability that may as well be a power. If you jump while sprinting, you do a super long range lunge. It actually has a ton of practical uses in combat, and you've likely seen me using it pretty extensively in my footage. But if you aren't sprinting, you do a jump so pathetic it can barely climb up boxes you're intended to be able to climb over. What kind of puny jump is this, seriously? I want to talk about the guns, which are generally your standard shooter fare. The game doesn't really do anything too risky or adventurous, so I'll just discuss a bit of a highlight reel. I already mentioned that the pistol is staggeringly awful, but I should also mention that the SMG is also awful and not worth talking about at all. Sounds like an angry typewriter too. When you're talking about an FPS game, it's mandatory to talk about the shotgun, so I'll oblige. The shotgun in this game is bizarre, not necessarily awful, but it's one of the least damaging shotguns I've ever used. On top of that, the mag size is, in professional terms, diarrhea. It can take up to five shells to kill one of these ratty werewolves. I ditch it for the flamethrower every time. The assault rifle is also a little weird. It does okay damage to monsters, but absolutely mops the floor with humans. You need to dump almost an entire mag into most creatures that kill them, and that's a pretty low estimate. One headshot is enough to kill a human on the other hand, so that's a pretty weird damage range. The best weapon in this game is hands down the LMG. It's got decent range, damage, a huge mag, abundant ammo, pretty good accuracy too. It mows down werewolves pretty good. Despite that pretty good rampage factor it has going for it, it still takes almost two entire mags to kill a griffin. Finally, the last weapon I want to talk about is the flamethrower. It's actually a pretty unexpected standout, it's more like a short range napalm cannon than anything else. All it takes to kill a werewolf is two quick puffs, which is a world of difference from an entire magazine with an assault rifle. It is ludicrously powerful, with the only downsides being its scarcity. Just look how quickly it takes on a minotaur, who are intended to be mini bosses. Minotaurs just get absolutely curb stomped in this game, it's actually pretty amusing. They're often distracted, so you can easily supply them with their daily dose of metals from behind. Here, I filled one with lead so good that it crashed my game. That was the only crash in the whole game, thankfully. Flamethrowers are a really primitive weapon when you think about it. All they do is spew out fire. The Greeks had access to that. Why didn't Theseus have this minotaur killing business so easy? This game also has grenades and molotovs, but they're dubiously useful. You need to hold down the grenade button in order to charge your throw, which is a very bizarre design choice. If you try to just throw them, you'll drop them at your feet, because Deckard has butterfingers. Most of the time, they'll probably hit an invisible wall. Meaning the grenade type does much damage to monsters, and frag grenades are only effective against humans, who seemingly act like they've never seen grenades before. Seemingly mistaking them for high-impact confetti bombs. Keen-eyed viewers may have noticed something in my gameplay. The awful sensitivity while aiming down sights. I'm moving my mouse as slowly as possible and just look at how much it jumps. This undermines almost all combat with humans who are generally better dealt with using long-range weapons like the assault rifle where, you know, you're stuck looking through the scope. I've never seen this so egregious in a game before. Adding to that, the muzzle flare in this game is pretty huge. It's not too awful, but it's so hard to see through it at times. You know how a lot of modern shooters force you to use iron sights or else you have an accuracy of a cross-eyed person with limp wrists? Sighting up often felt detrimental when I wasn't at long range. If anything, this game's discouraging me from using iron sights. For the time, that's pretty bold. So overall, the combat is varied and mobile. It has a relatively pleasant blend of aspects from modern shooters and more old school shooters. The bullet sponginess of enemies and awful iron sights are problems, but they're certainly nothing game breaking. Griffins eating up the entire ammo capacity of an LMG can be obnoxious, but the game's still kinda easy, so I'll let it slide. Let's cap off the gameplay by talking about the levels and their design. In terms of visuals, this game can actually punch well above its weight. It's rather grey at times, a little foggy, too much of it takes place underground, but the general detail is pretty good for a double-A shooter. They do a great job with the scale, especially. There's some pretty great detail to the city center. In this early level, there's a massive golem roaming around. It's an actual part of the level, you can actually get squished by it. In this cemetery level, you can see a cathedral over the horizon. It's actually pretty nice looking. Look at this massive three-way battle through that same cathedral. It gives off a pretty great sense of scale. Oh hey, it's the Gnome Depot. One location you visit in this game is the Houses of Parliament. It feels slightly out of place, but it's still fun nonetheless. This game actually loves its destruction at times. A lot of it is scripted, but you can do some big damage to the environment when it does let you play around. I didn't deface the Houses of Parliament, the Griffins with rocket launchers did.
The level design itself is fine. It's generic or overly scripted at worst, above average at best. Don't be expecting anything particularly dynamic or a corridorous. Well, I really wrote that. Most good level design philosophy isn't immediately present in a lot of this game, though it does do a good job of varied cover and sight lines. As a rule of thumb, Legendary does better spectacle and scale than actual encounters. But this level design does commit a cardinal sin, and it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. I don't know if there's a proper technical term for it, but I just call it awful environmental puzzles, AEPs for short, I'm coining that. AEPs are not hard because they're brain busting, they're hard because they expect you to make bizarre and unintuitive assumptions or observations. They usually fail to establish that they're even present, confusing players and maybe even making them think that they went the wrong way entirely. The garbage can puzzle early in the game is infamous, but I've definitely seen much worse. Thankfully this pendulum swings the other way more often than not, where it'll blatantly highlight what you're supposed to shoot in glowing green. Gee, I wonder what I'm supposed to do here. I don't know. I want to address the sound design though, there really isn't much to say here. It's overwhelmingly serviceable. It's not great sound design, but it's not awful either. I find that the major problem is that the guns don't sound too powerful, handful of sound effects are used too frequently, some sounds are just outright grating, and human alleys and opponents have almost no dialogue, so you may as well be fighting werewolves with guns. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that you get some human alleys now and then. They're not exactly useful. Yeah, just eat my rock at the back of your head, why don't you? But what does stand out to me here is the music. Once again, it's nothing particularly spectacular, but it does have some soul and a unique sound. It's often ambient, but it does pick up for the set pieces, larger battles, and boss encounters. Main menu isn't too bad either. Most other games of this era would have settled on a serviceable but forgettable and subdued orchestral soundtrack, but this one went for metal. It's not anything against orchestral music, but this has some charm to it. I'll remember this. We've been betrayed. The coke machines have turned on us. By this point, I feel like I've addressed everything that's important, so I want to finish up by talking about the final stretch of the game. Skip here if you don't want any spoilers, but I don't know why you'd bother to spare yourself, frankly. Alright, let's go. So in the final stretch, you're climbing a skyscraper up to confront our antagonist, LaFay, who has Pandora's box and is about to use it to abolish the IRS for good. You can't let that happen, so you must ascend up to fight him personally. Okay, fine, it's time to talk about the legendary, get it, elevator puzzle. Before you can fight the final boss, you have to face the hardest foe in the game, the antagonist second in command, this elevator. It is unique for being the first boss fight in a video game ever made to require the player to go outside of the game in order to fight it. In order to solve this brain buster, the player must close the game, browse the legendary folder in My Games, find PandoraEngine.ini, set max smooth frame rate to 30, and then relaunch the game. Now that you've solved the elevator puzzle, you can continue on to the final boss who you fight mono e mono and his army of goons. It's a really easy final boss fight. It's not even actually a final boss fight. It's just an arena. There's no music for most of it either, which is kind of lame. But thankfully, as compensation, you do get to see the antagonist die in the most slapstick way I've ever seen a villain die. Pandora's box explodes, Decker gets betrayed by his allies, and then the game decides a sequel bait with the promise of a pet griffin named Peter. Naturally, the sequel never came. So, Legendary. It's alright. I wouldn't call this game great, but it's far from bad. It's probably 6.5 out of 10 or so from me. It's nothing particularly special, but I liked it a lot more than I disliked it. It feels a tiny bit like a precursor to the modern Wolfenstein games that hybridize first-person shooter design philosophies from multiple eras. This game came out not too long after the beginning of the Call of Duty craze, where campaigns in first-person shooters became a lot more cinematic, linear, and set-piece focused. Elements such as sprinting and iron sights became more and more common, and every game had to have human grunts to fight, though maybe you can blame Half-Life for that one. Still, despite not being all that innovative, it's still a pretty good AA game. 
I wouldn't hold a grudge against someone frustrated that they paid 60 George Washingtons for a roughly 5 hour long campaign, no. Today you can get this game for utterly dirt cheap, it's a literal bargain bin title. 2 bucks on Steam and as low as 50 cents during a sale. For 50 cents it's pretty hard to complain about the game's shortcomings, it'd be hard to find a much better bargain for 2 quarters, let alone 1 half. And that's it for the episode, I'm hoping to cover more obscure, mediocre, contentious games in the future. Tune in next time for whatever bizarre aberration of game design I'll decide to play next. Oh boy, a sewer.